Okay, well, I'll just start recording now, but I'll uh, I'll tell you about this linear no threshold model. And just insert a before we get started, I'll insert a new uh, slide here and just explain it. So the the debate was whether the linear no threshold model model LNT and the LNT is used to assess risk, and it's used to assess um, the risk of cancer induction. Okay. I mean, there's a there's a risk assessment for what they call deterministic effects. Now they've renamed that to something else. The deterministic effect is effect that you will get with a certain amount of radiation that you expect. Okay, so at a certain level, a high level of radiation, if you radiate your abdomen, for example, you'll throw up and you'll get sick, and you'll have, that's one side effect. Another side effect of radiation that we know is the lens of the eye. You'll get cataracts after a certain amount of radiation. Those are deterministic effects. Those are effects that we know will happen. The linear no threshold model means is for uh, induction of cancer, and they usually plot it dose, and this is um, uh, effects. Okay, so after after a certain amount of dose, like say uh, say what was the level? I believe it was 10 millisieverts. Don't quote me on this. After 10 millisieverts for the for the fetus, we know that the fetus will. A certain percentage of fetuses will experience certain side effects. Okay? So we know that something happens after 10 milliseeds, but we don't know what happens less than 10 milliseeds. And that's for fetuses. Okay, what about humans? For humans, we're looking at somewhere at around 200 millisieverts. And whenever we talk about radiation, for, oops, let's just do 200. Radiation protection value. <laughs> no, I deleted the million. Radiation protection values. Uh, we're always talking about millisieverts, dose equivalent. Okay, because it's not we're not measuring energy. Dose is energy. Okay, millisieverts. Remember the difference between millisieverts and dose. There's a multiplication of a quality factor. That quality factor is not something measurable. It's usually a factor that we assign to organs, that we assign to dose, and it's, it's sort of arbitrary and it's changed over the years. So millisieverts not a very scientific unit. It's a it's somewhat arbitrary. So we know that we know that after 200 millisieverts we start to see effects in, in humans. But what happens? What happens to effects um, to effects below 200 millisieverts? So so we have some data from mostly from Hiroshima uh, and other Saki bomb survivors. That's where most of our data comes from uh, in terms of cancer induction. So our data shows that as you irradiate, as your dose goes up, your effects go up. How your cancer induction goes up and your effects go up. But what happens down here? What happens uh, these doses below this value? And this is important because when we calculate shielding, we want to, when we calculate shielding, say there's somebody next door to, to a vault. Okay, we have a linear accelerator vault and there's an office next door and there's somebody sitting there. How low do we need to create the shield? In other words, how low a dose can this person get? Is it 2 mR per hour? Is it 1 mR per hour? If we knew that 2 mR per hour creates certain effects, then we want to go lower to 1 mR per hour. And then, so we want to go to the point where we have no effects, no radiation effects. Okay, so that's where, that's why those are low values, 2, 5, those are all val low values that we don't know. We know that if you're standing at, uh, on the other side of the wall and you get 2 mR per hour, we know that instantaneously you're not going to start to throw up and you're not going to get a, 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 a camera. But will you get cancer? Five years down down the road, because you've been sitting over there, that's something that's very difficult to, to determine. It's kind of like the difference between saying, I'm going to take one aspirin, and one aspirin doesn't do me much harm. And actually, the the example they used in the um, in the talk was rat poison. And the speaker said that many of us take rat poison. Uh, and do you guys know what I'm talking about? Like it's just in food. No, rat rat poison. Another word for rat poison is coumadin. And Coumadin is a drug we give to people to thin their blood so they don't clot. Okay, so people who have a tendency or propensity for clots, they can get strokes. And so they'll take Coumadin to thin out their blood. And so, so the speaker says, we all take poison. Not we all, but many of us take poison every day in the form of Coumadin. If we took a lot of that, we would bleed out and die. Okay, and so, so but we, we know, because we use, we use Coumadin on humans, what a safe level is. Okay, but, but we don't know that for radiation. So the question is, do we just take this line? We know this line is linear. Okay. Do we just take this line and uh, extrapolate it right through zero? 
and say, well, we know that for for uh, a dose of a thousand a thousand millisieverts, you know, we have death, for example. Okay, and so for 500 millisieverts, whole body dose, say 500 millisieverts, we have um, some kind of uh, digestive digestive uh, side effects, or the patient gets sick, or, uh, and then so as you go down, your side effects we can't. Uh, and, then, and then the side effects will obviously be cancer induction as you get down to lower values. So is the percentage, so now if we talk about cancer induction, so say 200 millisieverts, for example, I'm just going to throw out a number, uh, corresponds to 10% of cancer induction in the general public. All right, so then, then if you have an equation, then you could say at 1 millisievert, you have whatever this line turns out to be, you know, whatever it is, 0.3%. So that value is not zero. Okay, so which means that if the person on the other side of the vault in one year gets one millisievert, they have a 0.3% chance higher than a person who doesn't work next to a vault. Okay. So can we use that kind of reasoning? Or is there data to show that this actually this line should be doing this? Okay, and and some of the a couple of the speakers actually argued for that and they said there's data that shows that. That as you get below a certain level, you're going to, you guys are going to hear this all again with uh, Dr. Rolschak's course. Uh, at a certain level, your cells start to protect themselves. So as you insult them, insult meaning as you give them some radiation, the cells talk to each other, and it, the, our body works like a like a system. It's an organ. So if you irradiate the liver, um, the cells will talk to each other and say, "Hey guys, this has happened," and the DNA will adapt. You know, we adapt to a lot of things that that occur to us, but the bodies have immune systems that do that. So the immune system is going to adapt to it, and then it's going to protect it. And so at low levels, so if you irradiate our, your cell, our cell, if our cells become irradiated at low levels, they start to show protection, okay, which doesn't happen at high levels because it occurs too quickly. So does this happen? So some, some data shows this, and then some other data actually shows this, that it gets worse. And so there were some and there were some speakers that were arguing for this data, and some speakers were arguing for that. And then one speaker said, and then, you know who was there? Eric Hall was there. He was one of the speakers, and he's the guy who wrote the book that you guys are going to use. He's an older um, gentleman. He's been doing radiobiology for many, many years. And actually, Wallace Shack told me that she, her book is going to be the update to Hall's book. So she's trying to write a book. Anyway. Uh, he was saying that this data has error bars that are this big. Now, when you get to down to these levels, your error bars are huge. You take a data point and put an error bar. I love the graph. And so this data is not reliable. Okay, so the consensus of the whole debate was that the linear no threshold model cannot be used for quantitatively assessing risk. Okay, it should be. We need to use something for shielding because when we shield a, a vault. We do this quantitatively. We we have to figure out how much radiation is on the other side of the room, what the state regulation levels are. Those levels come from this straight line. Okay, they come down to this line. So we need to use something to calculate the barrier thickness because we're using numbers. So we use we. They said that it's okay for radiation protection, but it's not okay to assess risk. Like say a patient goes to the doctor and says, "I just got a CT exam, and I was told that I have you know uh, what is it typically three milligram." Three to, to three to eight milligram times the quality factor, so around three millisieverts. I just got three millisieverts a dose. What's my risk for cancer? The doctor should not be saying your risk for cancer is 0.3 percent. Okay, so that's not what we should be using this LNT model for. We should be using it for shielding. Okay, I didn't know I was going to talk so much about that. Does that make sense? This rate of knowledge is very interesting because uh, to that. it's very interesting because it's an area that we know very little about. Yet greatly affects how our patients' outcomes and greatly affects uh, the public's uh, anxiety about radiation. So anyway, on to, on to today. Oh, before we go on, uh, let's do a couple of practice problems. Let's do a blank slide. I have these. I took screenshots of these right here. Let's do a couple of these. Oh, yeah. All right. Okay. Uh, here, let's do these all together. Okay, this is from Rapex. All right. 
sorry this isn't the best looking slide, but I took it with my phone <laughs> on my desk today. All right, so let's go through these. Um, tissue maximum. Let's go. Actually, let's go around the table. I'm going to pick on you guys today. Uh, let's start, Jimmy. I'm going to start with you. The tissue maximum ratio at D max, and this is multiple choice. So, what do you think? Increases with increasing energy, decreases with increasing energy, or it's always one. Increases with decrease with increasing SSD. I think it's always one. Everybody agree? Yeah. Yeah. Correct. Uh, it, it, does it increase with de increasing energy? Not if it's always one. Okay. Uh, decreases, no, not if it's always one. Increase, obviously not. Okay, all of the following are true. Uh, this is for you, John. All of the following are true regarding PDD except increases with, in so this is, these are, these multiple choices with except are a little tricky because you have to think backwards. All of the following are true except one increases with increasing energy. Would you say that's true? I'm going to read it all first. Yeah, sure. Okay, depends on field size? Yes. Okay, is the dose at depth expressed as a percentage of dose at D max? Yes. Okay, decreases with increasing SSD? No. Correct. Increases with increasing SSD. Right, and decreases as depth increases? Yes. All right, cool. John, should you get the next one? Who would have? Okay, this one. Use the following data for questions T3. We could do, you could do T3. I think that. Oh, the slow scroll. Okay. <coughs> We use the following data to do the next question. Our whole brain treatment is delivered with parallel opposed isocentric beams, lateral fields. The patient's thickness is 16 cm. The MU per field to deliver a total of 300 is what? So, so you've got three depths. This looks like the max over here. And an 8 and 14.4. They give you a TMR for 20 by 20. They gave you a PDD. Uh, output D max. Is that? If you notice that it's not one, okay, for some reason. Mm -hmm. okay, so what do you need? You get power plus fields. What's the first thing you do to calculate on you? I'm going to move this over here so I can draw over here. Remember, you, we set up a couple of things first, and then we say mu equals, and we write the mu equation. Oh, sorry about this. Where we're going to start. I'm trying to sort through all that that's given us. I know. I know. So two fields. I'll just draw two fields. One field here. One field here. Field size is the same. 17 by 23. 26 mv. We want to get 300 to the mill with line from both of those fields. Right. So each one gives a portion of that. Let's go. Cool. Correct. I put it down. 
Oh, yeah. Yeah, an X is for you. Okay. You got it? Your choice. Is there your choice. Okay. I was thinking about using PDV. This one, right? Yeah. Okay. That's a real PDV. Now it's disappearing on me. Uh, just because when you start drawing, it brings all the dark points. I know, but it didn't do that before. Oh, oh yeah, it didn't. It no. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Isocentric. Okay, so do we use PDD for isocentric? What is that? Another word for isocentric? Oh, it makes it SAD. SAD, correct. So, if we use SAD, do we want to use PDD? No, then we use TMR. Okay. What's the first thing we need to do? Figure out our field size. Yeah, so equivalent square, excuse me, equivalent square is what? Is it? 17 by 23? 17 by 23 becomes a 19.95. Okay. So 17, let's just do this. 17. So 2AB, 19 times 23 over 17 plus 23 equals 19.1? 95. Okay. Okay, what's next? So we've got a 20 by 20 field. Good. That corresponds to this. All right. Can we jump right to MU? What do we need? Well, if you're not sure, you could write the MU equation and then, you know, write out all the parameters underneath it and then just trying to kind of work those out. Okay, so you need, we need, we know it's, well, it's usually one centigrade per MU, but now they're telling us it is, at SAD is 1.86. Okay, so 1.86. 0.86. 0.86, 1.086 times what? Okay, TMR times what? more stuff under there, right? What else? SCP. SCP, okay. Three times what? Inverse. Inverse square, okay. ISF times what? Okay, there's other things, but we'll talk about them today. All right, so let's go. So what's the dose? Well, first of all, do we know what TMR is? Yeah, given. Okay, it's given. We've got the right field size. What about the depth, right? TMR depends on depth and field size. What's our... Well, our depth delivery to 80. Okay, patient's thickness is 16 cm. Okay. So 8 is correct, right? TMR uh, for 8. So we're going to use this one. Okay? So we have TMR, S sub CP. What about S sub CP? So these buggers didn't give it to us. Oh, I was supposed to assume one. Oh. Um, I wonder if uh, I wonder if it's if it's built into this. Maybe. That's why it's one point yeah, always six. That could be why. So you have to make that assumption. Okay. Yes, sir. Inverse square is one. Right. Okay. So what do we got? So what numbers are there? So those. So. 150. Okay. 1.86 times 867. 867? Yeah. Uh, how about SCP? We don't care, right? That's okay. It's okay. so zero there. ISF is zero. All right, what do we get? Uh, 159.3. 159.3. Okay, so that's B. I've got the answers here. Answers. You guys have access to these, by the way. They're all in the, they're all in our library outside of Nina's office. Yeah. Questions and answers. Here we go. Question ten. Okay, question ten. Um, the answer is B. Yeah, that's what we said. Wait, that's the wrong question. The whole brain treatment is delivered. What number? That was the. It wasn't at the top, right? It was the. One, two, third question? Yeah, T3. 
right here. Okay, T3. Oh, I have two books. T3 is B, yes. 159. Okay, next. Jimmy. So next question. Okay, now we got it all. All right, next question. Um, if the whole brain feels the previous question were treated at 100 centimeters as a C, the immune profile would be what? Uh, pretty much the same, just use SSD setup. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to use the I'll edit 100 SSD and the SSD safety. Okay, and the output. The output at 100 SS, SSD was 1.052 times what? Yeah, the, we had a PV for a one for 20 by 20. Yeah. Is that the one? Depth of eight. Depth of eight. So that's 77.1 divided by 100. Yeah. SSD would we don't care about. We're going to assume that the dose rate takes that into account. Right. What about inverse square? That's it. Uh, it's the it's all in there, right? Yeah. Okay. So what's that? Uh, it's 185. 185. And that corresponds to that corresponds to C. So T4. C is correct. Okay. Next one. Doing good. Doing good. Doing good. Okay. Next one. Scroll down. Let me see the maximum tissue dose would be an SSD treatment. Yeah, for the SSD treatment in the previous question, the maximum tissue dose. Uh, SSD So the dose is yeah, it's the a prop. So it's a depth of eight. At the depth of eight. But we're looking at the max because right. it wants to know where the max tissue dose is. Yeah. So you have the PDD from the first beam is at the maximum or one and the PDD from the other beam is at the depth of fourteen point four. Right, that's true. Mm -hmm. For the SSD treatment. Together. The maximum dose to the beam axis is approximately percentage of the midline dose. For the prowl pose, right, it considers both beams. Yep. All right, well, so, okay. So, if there was only one beam, what would the percentage be of the Dmax? It would be 1 over 77, wouldn't it? Yeah, it would be about 1.3 or 100%. Okay. So what you guys can do is you can figure out what the dose is at Dmax. Okay, from those. So the dose at Dmax is going to be, it's going to be um, this times the inverse of this. Okay, so let, let's do that. So would it just be the answer divided by 0.77? Yeah. So 240. Okay. 240, that's for one beam. Right. Okay, so one beam is getting 240, and then the other beam, let's get that data back up. What's the what's the dose from the other beam? So 
the boy from one beam. times 0.568, right? Because we're uh, going the other way around. Yeah, so 185 is from the other beam as well, same goes. But 185, and then if you take 185 times 0.568, well, well but the 0.568, that's the PD. Remember what the PD is? Oh, it's dose of depth divided by dose of Dmax. Those are mu, not dose. These here? Yeah, yeah those are mu. <laughs> Jimmy's right. Oh. So they're not dose. We want to calculate those. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's not going to work. So what's the dose of Dmax? Hmm? Uh, the dose at Dmax, uh, the dose rate is given and just multiply by the M. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the dose of Dmax for, the, for this beam is going to be 185 on you. Things. Times the dose rate uh, 1.052. Oh, uh, yeah. Right? So what's that? 194.6. Okay, so that's the dose to Dmax. From that one beam. This is a one eighty five. Okay, what about the other beam? The other beam, same as you. Okay, so one eighty five. Right. So 185 mu times, what is it? Well, times the dose rate first, right? 0.052 times. Uh, right? 185 times that, so what does that come to? 10.5. Okay, so the total dose is 5. Okay, the maximum dose will be at a depth of Dmax. Yeah, the dose at this point is the entrance plus exit doses. So it's 150 times the PDD Dmax, PDD at one midpoint plus that. So they have 150 um, over 0.77 plus 150 over 0.56. So they get 1.017. Yeah, that's what we get. Will you? Yeah. Oh, where did the 1.02? Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's fine. Okay, cool. So we got that right. You see, these can get a little tricky. So, all right, let's. Um, so, I just want to do a couple of those. So, let's go on to the lecture now. Okay, lecture 14, acidosis and distributions. Okay, so let's. I've got some pictures in there. Maybe we might have to turn the lights out. Let's see the pictures better. So, acidose curves. Isodose curves, as you probably have all heard of, are lines connecting points of equal dose. And we use isodose curves to show us where the dose is going on a treatment plan. So the maps of dose, they can be expressed as normalized. Uh, so a normalized isodose 
uh, I say those curves are curves that are typically percentages. And then there are I say those curves that are absolute dose, where each line has a corresponding dose, such as 2,000 centigrade or 3,000 centigrade, versus 100%, 90%, 80%, etc. So a normalized I say those line um, is one where you would pick a point within your the, within your patient's body, and you would assign that point to be your normalization point, and then all the doses within the body would be divided by whatever dose that point is. So that point times 100, so it's a percentage. So then that point becomes your reference point, and say that point's 2,000 centigrade. All the points in the body will be divided by 2,000, and we multiply by 100, so it becomes an isodose, a percentage, isodose line. The normalization point is usually chosen to be at the intersection point of the beam's isocenters, which is typically which typically coincides to the center of the tumor. That's just what's done. That's just standard of practice. You can pick a normalization point anywhere you want in the body. That is that's just typical standard of practice. So standard practice says that isocenter should be 100 percent Okay, and these are some examples of isodose lines. This uh, let's see, do we know what they are? Okay, so A is this is from Khan's book. And this is a screen <clears throat> screen capture from Khan's, seat, uh, Khan's online. You know how you can go online in Khan's book and look at all the diagrams. So I just did that and just pasted it on here. So and, uh, it doesn't turn out as clear as I thought it would. But anyway, A is 200 kVp, and A is this one here. Sorry, it's rotated, but anyway, they're lateral beams, right? So A is a 200 kVp. Do we ever treat patients at 200 kVp? Last quarter, yeah, one of the first lectures. Yes, therapeutic X-ray tube, orthovoltage tubes, superficial orthovoltage. So, they're not that common, but we, we did in the past treat patients at 200 kVp, and that's the isodose lines. No, notice there's no uh, there's no buildup here. Okay, so D max is on the surface. Now B is a cobalt 60. B is up here, cobalt 60. So. And then uh, C is 4 and B. C is over there. And then the last one is uh, D is 10 and B. So that's 10 and B. What are the what differences would you guys say exist between those isodose curves? Let's just bring out some differences. In the A, they're kind of bowed. Yeah, bowed. They're bowed out this way. They're bowed laterally. Is that what you mean? Oh, they're bowed in this direction, like they kind of point. Yeah, point in. Yeah, true. Yeah, so the center looks like they're centrally peaked, right? All right, so for K, for low uh, for low energy beams, they're centrally peaked. What else is a distinguishing characteristic about these low energy ones? And you go farther out, there's more more lateral scatter. Okay, and we know that low energy beams will scatter laterally more than high energy beams. Okay. So more lateral scatter. What else? What other differences do we find? What about the depth dose? If I pick a depth, I know it's hard to see these numbers, but if I pick a depth, the percentage will be different in this one compared to this one compared to that one, right? Where would the where would the percentage be the highest? Yeah, 10 MB. The highest energy would have the highest PP. So I could draw, I can I can take a profile down here, and if I took a profile and met and plotted all the numbers, it would look like this. This is, what is this now? B is cobalt? Yeah, B is cobalt. So it would look like that. It would look like a PDD if I did that. Okay. And I did a profile for 10, and I plotted it, it would look like the 10 PDD. It would look like that. 10 cobalt. Okay. So the PDDs are different. What else? There's one other, one other characteristic that, that you would, something that distinguishes this the the B from the C and the D. What's the difference between just looking at the B, the C, and the D? What's, these have something in common that this one doesn't have. What's common to these two that this one is different? Now think about the machines themselves. That deliver that dose, that deliver the PVDs. What's different? 
What's the difference between the machines and the radiation? B is the only one that uses a source. Right. right. B is a radionuclide source. Okay. And these are linear accelerators. They're made by accelerating radiation. Well, the profiles of these beams are different. Right. A radionuclide uh, profile is different than a linear accelerator profile, isn't it? What are uh, what are these things? See those humps? These humps right here? Those are horns. Remember when when I draw profiles, I draw them like this. Okay, so those are the horns that you see in the profile. You won't see those horns in cobalt sixty. Why don't you see those horns? Where do the horns come from? Yeah. What what kind of filter? There's a particular filter we talked about a lot in this course. Lead? Mm -hmm. Just like lead? Mm -hmm. There's no lead in the head of the linac except for the shielding. Primary collimator in the linac? Mm -hmm. Oh, that's not a filter. Oh. That just restricts the beam size. Oh, where the where the horns come from? Uh, like a flattening filter. Yeah, flattening filter. So a flattening filter is that conical shaped filter that's up in the head of the machine. And well, so why do we use this? Because we know that if we didn't use this, the distribution of our of our beam intensity would be Gaussian, and we'd be we'd be over treating the center of the patient. So we put a flattening filter in there. And what does that do? Well, it Dmax. These parts of the beam don't attenuate as much as the center, so that this gets higher. And then as you get deeper into the tissue, it flattens out, and as you get even deeper, you get shoulders that look like that. So these horns over here, this particular lunatic tend to have bigger horns than this one. This one, for some reason, oh, you're, you're probably not seeing the horns because... Higher energy. Well, the higher energy have all horns too, but you would probably see it at an isodose line that they're not showing on this, on this plot, okay? All right, so those are the differences. Low energy side scatter, um, horns for horns for linear linear accelerator beams, and uh, no horns for cobalt sixty beams. So how do we measure these isodoses? Profiles are collected with a scanning system. You guys have seen me do that. The software joins points of equal dose and produces a plot of isodoses. The profiles are entered into the treatment planning computer, which then uses them to uh, which then uses them with different field arrangements to produce composite dose maps. So it takes it takes all these, all these isodose lines and overlays them on top. So if you have a, a beam coming from the left, or in this case, a beam coming from uh, from our our left, and then it takes another beam coming from the right, plots puts these two together, and then just adds up all the doses and recalculates the isodose lines. And that's how people did treatment planning before computers. By the way, we had the AECL, America, the uh, the atomic energy, AECL, atomic energy. I forgot what ACL is for. But ACL is, um, was a company in Canada who was making cobalt 60 units. And they published a whole bunch of these really large plots of isodose lines for different fields. And, um, and, what we, and I had them in, in the department at Lutheran. And so the, they were all hanging on a shelf. And you take them off the shelf and say you're treating a patient with a 5x5. Five five. You take the 5x5 five five isodose plot and then you put it down on the table and you take some tracing paper and put it on top of the isodose plot, and you would plot the lines on this tracing paper, and the tracing paper had a contour of the patient. Remember that contour I talked about with the lead wire? It had that. So we had the contour of the patient, and we had the isodose, so we plotted that, and then you take it, and you flip it over, you put the tracing paper back in, and then you draw for the lateral field, and then you would draw the points where the points intersected of the two plots. And where they intersected, you would add them. Okay? So you had an 80% and then an 80% from this beam and then a 20% from the other beam, that would be now be 100%. So you do that for all the points in there. If you have two more beams, like an AP and PA, you do that again. And then you would connect all the points, like you'd connect all the 80% and the 100%, and you connect them, and you'd have a composite isolate point. Okay, that's before treatment plan. Okay. So many depths and field sizes are required to achieve a complete set of data. Right, so when we're entering the data into our treatment planning computer, we need to scan 
um, many field sizes, and at times different SSDs as well for the different energies, and that's what we use. Okay, so this is this is an example of a setup where we have the water tank, and then we've got an electron comb there, and we're going to take uh, we're going to take SCOs. I'm sorry, we're going to take profiles with the electron comb. You guys have seen that. Factors affecting isodose distributions. So the isodose distributions are affected by energy, obviously, by field size, by SSD, uh, patient density. Okay, so once the computer calculates the isodose lines in the patient, it's affected by the density of the patient. Primarily what, when we're talking about density, what, why, is, why is the density affected? In other words, um, what, part, what um, anatomy of the patient would affect for the isodose lines? We're not all made of water, so what parts of us <coughs> would affect the isodose lines more than other parts? Bone, okay. air. Okay, bone. What else? Air. Air, bone. Okay, what else? You guys had any fillings? Okay, metal fillings, right? Metal fillings and metal implants. People have prosthetic, prosthetic hips. So those things, anything that, anything that changes the density of the patient is going to affect the isodose lines. And energy, isodoses are more penetrating at higher energies, as we just talked about. KV energy isodoses spread out more laterally due to the enhanced side scatter, and then the horns. We talked about those already. An increase in SSD makes the isodose lines like they are further apart due to a reduction of the inverse square effect. So in an, in an exam, I might show you some isodose lines. I'm going to draw really bad isodose lines here. OK, I'm going to show you some isodose lines. I'm going to say, what's the difference between this beam and And this beam, okay, so this is, a, say this is the first one's 100, 90, and 80, 100, 90, and 80. Am I asking, what are the differences between those two beams? So what could be the possible answers? Different. Which one's a higher? Second one, okay, because it drops more slowly. Okay, always think about a PDD when you're looking at this. Here's a PDD of a, a low energy, like cobalt 60, and here's a PDD of a high energy, okay? It drops more slowly, okay, so those lines drop more slowly. What else? What are there other reasons that they could be spread out more? Okay, SSD. Right? Right, increasing SSD. Is there another reason? Yeah, increasing field size. Field size, right. Okay. All right. And patient density, an increase in patient density with bone will cause a faster change in isodose lines within the volume of the increased density. Waypoint versus normalization point. Okay. Well, I introduced this topic already. Waypoint is the point inside the patient. Oh, not the waypoint, sorry. I haven't talked about waypoint yet. Waypoint is the point inside the patient where the treatment dose is assigned. At some point, you want to calculate and use. If you don't want to calculate and use and you just need to see percentage isodose lines, you don't need to put a dose in your treatment planning system because it's just going to be relative isodose lines. But at some point, you want to know how many MUs to give to give a certain dose. Okay. And so if you haven't told the computer what dose to give, it has no idea what I'm used to give because these are proportional to each other. So when you assign the dose, so you want to assign the dose, and you want to assign it to a point in the patient. Okay. Because you can't assign a dose to a volume. It doesn't make sense. You have to assign it to a point. You have to say, I want this dose at this point. Let me backtrack. You can assign a dose to a volume. Okay, some treatment plan in the computers allow you to do that. And the way the way that works is, say this is the volume. The treatment planning computer allows you to say, I want 95% of that volume to get a certain dose. Or I want the minimum dose to that volume to be something. You could do that. And what it does, say the latter, what I just said. The minimum dose to this volume is 2,000 centigrade. What it's going to do is it's going to look at all the percentage isodose lines and it's going to look for the minimum dose that this PTV gets, and it's going to say, well, the minimum dose is at that point, based on your beam arrangement and, and the isotope sense. And you want to give 2,000 there. OK, well, I'm going to make that the waypoint. I'm going to make that the waypoint. I'm going to assign that to be 2,000. 2,000 centigrade. And once it, now it has a point. And you can calculate any use from the beams based on that point. OK, so that's one way. But typically, it's a very basic case. You have four fields coming in to treat a prostate or whatever, patient's volume, and typically you'll put a waypoint in the center. Okay? You'll say, I want to give 
two thousand centigrade or whatever it is to that point, and it'll calculate the MUs. Okay, so now normalization point is a point in the patient that's assigned one hundred percent. Okay, but not always. The same point as the waypoint. So this this is the typical typical case, which is pretty basic. Um, you folks, if you're taking treatment planning now, so Theo's going to cover this too. Okay, this is a basic concept of treatment planning. So have you guys got ready yet? Waypoint point versus normalization. Yeah, we've just been getting familiar with the software. Oh, the software. Okay. Yeah. Get as much practice with the software as you can. We've got a computer here. Just sit down and just start chugging away because that's the biggest challenge is knowing what buttons to click and how to, how to get a beam on here, how to put the IC center on here, how to rotate the gantry, how to rotate the pump, all that. Just get over that learning curve because the, tre the actual treatment planning skills comes after all, after that. Okay, the strategy, because that's when you start planning strategy. Okay, limits one waypoint per beam, one normalization point per planet. So what does this mean? Well, does it make sense when I say limits one waypoint per beam? So if you have four fields, you can actually um, assign a waypoint to each field. You can say this field here, I want the 500 centigrade to this point from this field. And I want 600 centigrade from this field to that point. And you can do that. Some certain planning systems let you assign a different waypoint to each beam. Okay. But Eclipse doesn't let you do that. Eclipse has one waypoint. Okay. So it, what it does is you assign a waypoint, say in the center, and, it, and then it divides it divides the beams to deliver that dose to that waypoint. You, can, you have the flexibility of changing the weights. So you can change the weights. And it will, and Eclipse will correspondingly change the dose to that waypoint for each beam based on how you're changing your weights. But XEO, on the other hand, allows you to assign a different waypoint for each beam. Okay. And that complicates things a little bit, but there are advantages too. Gives you an added flexibility. Uh, what about, so we know we can assign limits, one waypoint per beam. That's only in Eclipse. Eclipse. Axial allows you to assign all waypoints. Well, what about normalization points? Can we assign different normalization points for the same patient, for the same you know, four beams? No, it doesn't make sense. You can't say I want 100% here and I want 100% there. Okay, that doesn't make any sense. So we know that if we're going to normalize, it's going to be one normalization point per beam. Okay. Moving on now to missing tissue. So missing tissue, what does that mean? That means that means uh, that as a beam, as a beam um, hits a patient, here's the patient. As a beam comes in and interacts with the patient surface, if this was a flat surface, we know what the acidosis would look like. Okay, we just saw. It that previous slide, but it's not. Okay, so part of the beam has a certain SSD, part of the photons have a different SSD, okay, and so that has to be taken into account with the isodosis. So missing tissue on a tangential beams, for example, increases dose and area where most tissue is missing, which causes a non-homogeneous distribution. So if this beam goes all the way out, ten, remember what ten, do you guys know what tangential is? A tangential beam is a beam that part of it hits the patient and part of it hits the air. Okay. So it's like a grazing beam. And we do this for breast. That's how we treat our breast, breast patients. Part of it goes through the breast tissue and then part of it is open um, so that when the patient breathes and goes up and down, we're always treating the entire breast. So those are the tangential beams. So what this, what this bullet says is that this area right here receives the least dose because it has the most tissue that it has to go through. And this part here receives, receives the most dose because it has very little tissue that it's going through. Okay. So tangential beams tend to create isodose lines where there's a hot spot up here and these are, those are cold, cold areas here. Okay, and what we do to correct for this to make it even, so that we don't get hot spots and cold spots, is we use we can use compensators. Okay, and compensators are made of high Z materials such as lead, aluminum, or brass, and they're placed in the head of the, mach of the machine to preserve skin sparing. Okay, well, there's a lot, I'm saying a lot of things here. Skin sparing, that's a new term, right? Well, it's not a new term. Is it a new term? Skin sparing. It's not. You guys know what skin sparing is, right? 
What's skin sparing? Skin sparing is uh, okay. Skin sparing is the buildup effect. So as the bead hits the patient's surface, we know that there's a buildup effect of dose where this area here, uh, right at the right in the area of B, um, shallower to Dmax, gets less dose than Dmax. Okay. And that buildup effect looks like that. Right? There's the PDD. So this buildup region right here. This is this area here has lower dose than than Dmax. Okay, so we call this skin sparing because we're sparing some of the skin right at the surface. Okay, so now if we were if we wanted to get even distribution throughout this patient surface, we could we could put rice bags or something and fill all this in, and then we'd have an even dose distribution. But the problem with that is that we would lose all the skin sparing. Right, skin sparing is a good thing. We don't, want to, we don't usually want to treat the patient's skin, right? The tumor's deeper down. So we want to preserve, we call that preserving skin sparing. So, I mean, besides the hassle of putting rice bags on the patient and water bags, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's preserving skin sparing not to put anything on the skin. Why does putting something on the skin, um, why does that reduce skin, skin sparing? Because the buildup region will be in the material displaced. Yeah, it'll be in the material. Mm -hmm. Okay. So when we want to we want to compensate for these differences in, in SSDs, we're going to use metal compensators, and we're not going to put them on the patient. We're going to put them on the head of the machine. So here's an example of a beam coming in, AP beam. This could be a chest. This is like an axial cut, an axial cut of a chest wall. There's a tumor there. And this beam comes in, and this black line is an ice, one of the acidose lines okay, that covers the tumor. So if we put a compensator in the head of the machine, the acidose line becomes more uniform. So we're able to reduce treating this area right here. Why would this be deeper? You see how this area gets a little more dose? It's deeper because there's less tissue here to attenuate. So the acidose line goes deeper here than it does up here. Well, to even that out, because we don't, we don't necessarily want to treat this this deep, we'll put a compensator in the head of the machine, and this compensator is made, um, usually they're made to follow the patient's anatomy. Right. Have you seen, you guys seen compensators before? They have an eleutherum, or they used to use an eleutherum. Okay. The way compensators are built is, after the patient's been scanned, we send them that scan information to, the, to a compensator company, and they, they have a computer-controlled milling machine that cuts that cuts the metal in the shape in the negative of the patient's shape. Okay, and then we put that in the head of the machine, and we can correct for this. We can correct for uh, missing tissue. Okay, we also use bolus material. So, you guys seen bolus? It's that kind of soft. Every clinic has it. They usually come in one cm, two cm, max, you know, maximum three cm thickness, down to about three millimeter thickness, and we put that on the patient's skin. And so why do we do that? So tissue equivalent properties, bolus material has tissue equivalent properties. It comes in different thicknesses. And there's also this other stuff that comes in powder form in a bag. You add water and you can make bolus material. The purpose of bolus material is to bring isodoses closer to the surface. Okay. Most commonly used to provide enhanced dose to superficial tumors. That's when you don't want skin sparing. That's when you want to treat the skin. Also used to fill in areas of argument surface. Okay, so we can if there's a if there's a patient that has some uneven surface, usually face or something because of the, the, the SSD changes so quickly, we can put some bolus material to even that up. Okay, and there's a, there's a, again there's a chest wall, and if the tumor is more superficial, we can add bolus material to bring the isodose lines up. We can also use bolus material to prevent from treating too deeply. Okay, but typically, I, most of the cases, 99% of the cases, the bolus material is there to enhance the dose to the skin. Okay. Mm. okay these bullets are X's. That doesn't mean this is all bad. This looks like this looks like this is all bad. These are just bullets. Okay. Uh, so wedges. All right. So the first compensator I talked about was patient-based compensators that are milled, that are milled for each patient, custom. Wedges are not custom. We've all seen wedges in the clinic. And wedges are inserted in the head of the machine, as you know. They're typically made of steel or lead. They're meant to modify acidosis in an intuitive manner 
through a gradual attenuation. Okay, so when we put a, a wedge in the head of the machine, we know that the toe is going to get more dose than the heel. That's what I mean by intuitive. We understand what it's going to do. The wedge angle is defined at the angle of the isodose line at a depth of 10 cm. Okay, so what does that mean? That if you pick up a wedge and it says 30 degree wedge, that's not the angle of the fusical protractor. It's not the angle of the wedge. Because if you look at the wedge, it's actually got a lot of angles on it, like maybe four. Okay, then there's different steps in that. And by the way, there's, the reason it has different steps, those steps match up to the flattening filter. Flattening filter is also cut up on different steps. And those steps, if you diverge those uh, inflection points, they'll match up to, to the inflection points in the wedge. Um, so if you take a 30 degree wedge and you, um, and, and you want to know what, what 30 degree means, 30 degree means that if you put the, the, wedge, of the, the wedge in the head of the machine, and you've got a water tank, and you scan profiles with the chamber in this direction. Well, the wedge, what you're going to find as you scan those profiles is that the profiles look something like that, right? Okay, so as you scan through, your chamber is going to show a profile that looks like that, and the wedge is going to be in the head of the machine, and it's going to look like that. All right. So the lowest dose corresponds to the thickest part of the wedge. Okay. When you scan your 10 cm depth profile, and then you measure the angle between, you measure this angle right here. That's going to be the degree that corresponds to the wedge. Okay. So the 10 cm depth. Measure this angle here, the isodose line, at 10 cm depth, and that's the angle of the wedge. That's what 30 degree means. Okay. So it's not a physical. It's not a physical angle. It's a dosimetric angle. It has to do with the, the angle of the profile. Okay. Um, higher angle wedges usually have a thicker central axis, so the metal portion is thicker. Is that time? That time's totally wrong. Yes. Yeah, Okay. Uh, I was wondering. It, sound, it seemed like it was time for a break. But anyway, let's get through this slide and I'll give you a break. Higher angle, meaning 45, 60 degree wedges, the central portion of the wedge is thicker. The wedge is slightly hardened hard the beam and produce more patient scatter due to photon interaction. So this is very important. They harden the beam, which means that if you put a wedge in the head of the machine and you measure your PDD and you compare it to the PDD with no wedge, they're going to look different. They're going to look the PDD with the wedge is going to look like a higher energy. Not by much. It's a small difference, but it's measurable. You can measure it. Okay. Uh, so when you're commissioning a treatment planning computer, you need to scan wedge PDDs as well as open PDDs because the planning computer has to take that into account. So it slightly hardens the beams and produces more patient scatter. This is also an issue. Why is this an issue? The more patient scatter. What does that mean? So as the photons interact with the wedge. The wedge is like, it, it's, it's kind of like a light bulb. So if you look at a, a light bulb, the wedge being a light bulb and the light emanating, the light being the photons. So now photons are scattered all over when they hit the wedge. So the patient gets more whole body dose. Is it a lot more? It's not a, it's not a huge amount. Okay? The concern is, mostly the concern is for breast patients. So if you put a wedge on the medial field, medial field coming in and you're treating a breast, some of that scatter it's going to scatter into the contralateral breast, which is a healthy breast. Okay. And that scatter could contribute to cancer induction in the future later down for this patient, especially if she's young. She has a lot of years ahead of her. So certain physicians don't want a medial wedge being used on a patient uh, when you, you treat breast cancer. They're not opposed to a lateral wedge, but they don't want a medial wedge. Okay. That's not so much of a concern if you're using dynamic wedges. The scatter in dynamic wedge is less than a, a hard wedge. Uh, can be inserted in four directions, in our right or left. You guys know about that. The attenuation of a wedge must be accounted for when calculating and used through the wedge factor. Obviously, if you put a hunk of metal in the beam, you're going to need more in use to deliver the same dose. Okay, so that's where the wedge factor comes in. And then we'll uh, let's take a quick break, and we'll go get into this stuff.
keep going. All right, so these are isodose lines. Remember those first isodose lines in one of the, the first slides? Those are for open fields. The difference here is that these are for wedge fields. And so obviously the the wedge fields are going to be, you know, the wedge isodose lines, rather, are going to be hotter where the toe is in this area, right down here. You see how it, how the 80% is deeper here than it is at the heel. And then that wedge angle I was talking about, look for the tensium depth. Go down to tensium. It's, it's not indicated on here. I'm just going to try to really pick a point, go across, and measure measure that isodose line angle, and that's the wedge angle. Okay. So this is this is for uh, what's the difference here? This is 60, 80, 60. Yeah, I don't have the legend on here. This is from configure 11.6. A is normalized to D max. A is normalized to D max, okay. B is normalized to D max without the wedge. Oh, I see, okay. That's a little atypical. So, here's D max in this picture. Okay, so 100% is D max. And then here, you don't see 100% because 100% is without the wedge. Once you put the wedge in, all the isodose lines will drop. I don't know why he would show that. It's not that. Not that difficult to do that. All right, wedge factor. How do you measure it? Set up a water tank and place a chamber at 5 or 10 cm depth, the central axis. Take the reading for 100 mu in coulombs with the wedge in place, then take another reading with no wedge. Have you folks done this in IROC? Did you measure right wedge factors? No, we talked about it. We talked about it, okay. The ratio of wedge to no wedge is the wedge factor. Wedge factor is always less than 1. Okay, and. Uh, all right, so wedge factor varies slightly with depth and field size. Okay, so if you measure your wedge factors at 5 cm, you'll get a set of wedge factors. And then if you measure them at 10 cm, you get another set of wedge factors, and they'll be slightly different. Okay. So wedge factor increases with energy and field size and depth. Oh, I, can't, I can't keep my finger on there very long. Okay. And, all right, so which factor varies? Increase, it increases with energy, so it goes up. It's more than one, but it's never going to reach one. And it increases with field size and depth. Okay, and depth, okay. So let's let's figure out why that is. Why would wedge factor increase? If, if we know that the wedge factor is equal to... If we know that the wedge factor is equal to dose uh, with wedge and divided by dose open okay. at a depth of whatever, 5 cm. Let's put 5 cm. Why would the energy affect this? So I've got 6 mV. I measure the dose with. Dose meaning reading. So I take a Coulomb reading with my electrometer. Reading with the wedge divided by reading without the wedge for 6 MV, and then I do it again for 10 MV, and then I do it again for 18 MV, and I get different values. Why would I get different values? And all I'm changing is energy. Well, it has to do with the relative difference between these two, right? Obviously. We know that if I change the energy, the dose open will probably change too, right? So if I'm measuring at 5 cm, the dose at 18 mV will be higher than the dose at 6 mV at 5 cm. Okay, so that changes. This also changes. This is a different energy. But why would my numbers be different? So is it that the wedge is attenuating more at low energies than it is at high energies? Correct, exactly, yeah. So the relative difference between these two is higher at low energies than it is at high. High energies. Okay, so high energies, the wedge doesn't attenuate as much because the energies are more penetrating. They don't interact with the wedge as much as low energies. Okay, so that's correct. What about field size? It's the same effect. It's the scatter issue. Remember how field size affects the PDD and it makes it look like it's a harder beam because of scatter. It's the same issue with wedge factors. Okay, so the wedge factor also increases with field size. And then what about depth, the last one? So if I measure wedge factor at 5 cm, and then I measure wedge, and then I measure wedge factor at 10 cm, I'm going to get different sets of wedge factors. Now why would that be? Huh? 
Mm -hmm. But my whole set of wedges are at 10 compared to a whole set of wedge factors at 5. The beam is slightly harder at 10 than it is at 5. Just by a little bit. Because it's got more attenuation. The beam's been attenuating through wire more. So it's a harder beam at 10 than it is at 5. Okay, so again, small difference here. It's about 2% difference between 10 and 5. 2% difference for the different field sizes. Okay, so there's small, small differences, but they're there. Oh, what's this? That's interesting. Okay, here. Wedges can also be used as compensators. Remember that other slide with the compensator? So now I'm using I'm putting a wedge in the field and it does it does the same thing. It's just not as it's not as conformal as a as a compensator is. A compensator follows the curvature of the body bar. But the wedge can can achieve similar results. Alright, so this is a really busy slide, but this is what I use. This is an Excel uh, worksheet, and this is what I use to measure my wedge factors. So first, I take my open field readings. Reading one, reading two, reading three, and then I, uh, and then I take readings for different field sizes, five by five to thirty by thirty. Okay, so reading one, so here's the five by five reading one and two, and then I average it down here, and then open up my field size. These are all open, no wedges here. These are just open fields. These are my reference readings, the denominator and the wedge factor the equation. Once this is all done, then I put a wedge in the field. In this case, fifteen degree wedge. 10 MV photons, and the direction is in. Right, which way? Which way is the toe, toe pointing? If I put the wedge in, well, the toe is in. So it's towards the gantry, right? Yeah. Okay. What about if I put a wedge in the right direction? Well, I'm talking about varying wedges. The toes are varying. Um, who's right? You're right. Our patient's right. Patient, you're right. So our right. If you're looking at the gantry now, and you put a, a right wedge in, where's the toe? You're right? Yep. Right? Does everybody agree with that? I think it's patient's right in the white face. If it's head first supine. Yeah, if the patient's head first supine, it's patient's right. Not your right. 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 Okay, Don, did you get that? Yes. So it was opposite of what you said. Okay? So because the patient's lying supine, if you're looking at the patient, the patient's right is your left. Right? Because you're looking at them face to face. Does that make sense? Yes. I want to make sure you're getting all this. Yeah. I know you're checking on the computer. Well, I just want to make sure. Fine when I actually have the wedge because the little wedge has right, left. And yeah, but when you're treatment planning, you're going to put a right wedge in, and you're not looking at the wedge when you're doing treatment planning. You're just you're just saying right, left, in or out. So right. you need to know what direction that is. And you also have it when you're treatment planning. If your gantry is on the PA, I mean it's easy to visualize the gantry sitting there, and you say, okay, I'm going to remember that the toe is on the patient's. Right, when I put a right wedge in. What if the gantry is PA? Which way is the toe pointing? So if you're doing a treatment plan and you've got a PA beam, and you want to increase the dose on, say, your right, okay, how would that be a right wedge or a left wedge? Huh? Wait. So it's right wedge. And so if I uh, run through that again, here's a PA beam. I want to increase the dose here. Am I putting a right wedge in or a left wedge in? Huh? Left wedge? Right wedge? Josh, let's take a vote. We got three. You gotta break the uh, stem. Trying to figure it out. Like, which way's the head? Okay, so the head. So the, this is a PA beam. Okay, the head's here. Shoot this way. Here's the couch. I'm going to increase the dose on this side and decrease the dose on this side. Little dose, high, little dose, big dose. So a right wedge or a left wedge? Jimmy says right. He sounds very confident. You said left? It's right. It's right. Okay. Always start. It's hard to start here. Always start with the gantry up here. Okay. So gantry is up here now. Right. Okay. And then if I use a, a right wedge, it means my toes here, my heels here. 
So if I rotate this around to this position, this wedge comes around, the toe is here, and the heel is here. Okay, so this is a right wedge, right? We agree that with that, because this toe is on the right side of the patient. Right. And then we rotate around, and it looks like that. Okay. Doesn't it? Okay. So just think of just think of this thing rotating. Where does the toe go? Well, the toe stays on that side. So that's a right wedge. Um, okay. So anyway, get used to get used to thinking about that when you're doing treatment planning. It's quicker because if you put the wedge in the wrong direction, of course you can always look and verify that it's what you want. But it's, it also helps. It helps if you could do that ahead of time. Uh, all right, so then if I put the wedge in, and then I take three readings, you know, in this case two readings, and then I take an average. So with the wedge in place, and this is the direction in, again, set up different field sizes and take readings. Are these readings going to be higher or lower than without the wedge? They'll be lower. They'll be lower. Okay, I'm measuring at the central axis. And then the wedge factor is simply this, this reading here divided by this reading here. This reading here divided by this reading here. This reading here divided by da, 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 and get I get the different wedge factors. Okay, get a get a feeling of how different these wedge factors are across all, all field sizes. So, as I, as I mentioned, increase in field size increases wedge factor. Okay, but what's the difference? How much of it, percentage wise? What would you say? It's it's about two out of seventy. So what is that? Uh, Three percent, two percent. Okay. Yes, Thanks. So, since you actually got a lower factor from the ten by ten to the five by five, would that make you go back and redo it, or? Well, look at the difference. It's within experiment. <laughs> yeah, it's within measurement. So you wouldn't like worry about that. No. Mm -hmm. That's really small. That's a that's a point one percent or point two percent difference. I'm not worried about that. What's the just so you guys have a feeling, what's the reproducibility of taking readings in general? If you've got a good chamber and a good electrometer, what do you think the percentage reproducibility is between readings? So if you take one reading and then you take another reading, um, how much of a difference do you expect? Same conditions. What do you think? If if I if you got a ten percent difference, would you be concerned about that? Absolutely. Ten percent's huge. What about uh, five percent? You take a reading, take another reading, right? It's huge. Okay. What about one percent? Uh, you might scratch your head and say this doesn't look so good. It's usually it should be within a half a percent. Your readings should be between one reading and the next. You should have within a half percent. So that, that's just something you should know. That's a feeling that you should have when you're taking data. That if they're more than a half a percent, you should scratch your head about that. Okay. Uh, what's this now down here? Oh, directional. Uh, another thing I do is I change this. Okay, well this doesn't make sense because this says. I change the direction of the wedge and I measure it again. Why do you think that's important? Because the wedge might not be centered on the tray correctly. So if I rotate the wedge and I put it in a different direction, I should get the same reading because I'm at the central axis. The thickness through the wedge is the same, no matter what no matter what position I'm putting it in. And so I verify that. So I change the direction and I take readings again and I compare this with, in this case, the 10 by 10. So I compare these two. Okay, now. Now this says in and this says in, so it doesn't look like I changed direction. I think this is a typo, and this is really right, because I usually do my wedge factors in, in the right orientation. Okay, so this is right, and that's it. Uh, this is just wedge factor differences between different institutions. Uh, this is uh, across different field sizes. So as I change my field size, let's just pick one institution, LGH room one. Right now there's a cybernet unit in there, but that's that's what, that we had an old Linux machine. We had a, a variant. Uh, a variant 2100C in that room. So the wedge factor for different field sizes right here, these red triangles. And then I did, uh, I did I've, done a, I've done a whole bunch of machines in my time, but this is just three machines. This is the one at Christ Hospital. Okay, so look at the, there is a difference between different machines. We're getting 0 0.48 here, 0 0.49, 0 0.5. What's this percent difference here? 2 out of, two out of 5. It's not much. It's pretty small. So a very small difference between the between the three, but there is a difference, meaning that you shouldn't use a stock set of wedge factors for a machine. Like if some of your buddy gives you wedge factors, you shouldn't use those to calculate the amount of units. You should use the ones that you measure on your particular machine. Okay. So just the point I'm making is that wedge factors change from machine to machine. Okay, other types of wedges. Dynamic wedge, we know about dynamic wedge, we've always used them, right? 
You guys use them in, the, in IROC? Then I question is kind of how it works. We talked about them. Okay, didn't that, did you actually program them? And then show me use them? You didn't? Okay, we'll talk about that. So the dynamic wedge is a variant product and Siemens. And oh, by the way, you guys know that Siemens about two weeks ago uh, proclaimed that they're out of the radiation oncology market. Well, they pulled out. Yeah. Uh, my feeling is that they couldn't compete with Varian and Electa. They're moving ahead very quickly. They're bringing all the new technology into the machines and they're, they're keeping up, they're keeping pace with all the technology and all the customer demand. Siemens was not keeping pace. Okay, so technology was coming out, the machines were not, they weren't adapting into the machines. Customers wanted technology, and they weren't responding. So that's my feeling. So anyway, but there's still a bunch of seamless machines out there, right? Good Sam. Anybody here go to Good Sam? No. I think Stephanie goes to Good Sam. They have a seamless machine at Good Sam. Um, they're anyway. They're all over. Uh, so how does the dynamic wedge work? One of the collimator jaws, X1, X2, Y1, Y2. Sorry, I shouldn't say X1 and X2. It's really just Y1 and Y2, right? Okay, so either Y1 or Y2, one of the Y collimator jaws, moves through the field during beam on time. Okay. During the beam on time, the area under the moving jaws, toe, gets the least dose. Okay, so the toe always gets the least dose. The advantage of the dynamic wedges, therapists don't have to go in the room. This is remotely programmed. Okay. We pro put it in our treatment planning, put it on the treatment planning computer, part of the treatment plan, and then that information is sent to the record and verify system, which is sent to the treatment console, which is programmed up to the, the treatment console, and delivered. Uh, cons, wedging is only in two directions, Y1 and Y2. You must turn the collimator to get other directions. Okay, And there's also a field size limitation of 30 cm asymmetrically for variant. I'm not sure what the other limitations are. What does this mean? Here's a beam's eye view of a square field, central axis, OK? Y2 up here, Y1 down here. Y2, Y1. Okay, so this jaw can move. Once the beam starts and you have a dynamic wedge programmed, it starts in the open position. Okay, remember that. And then this jaw, say we're doing a Y1 wedge. That's called, that would be a, would that be an in wedge or an out wedge? If it's a Y1, if it's a Y1, what do you think? In or out? That would be in? Out. In, out? This is democracy. we got to vote. Okay, it's in. It's in. Why is it in? It's in because as this wedge moves in this direction, okay, it's going to move towards the central axis. Most of the dose will be delivered in this area. Okay, so this is going to be the hot area, and this is going to be the cold area. Why is this cold? Because most of the time this is spent under the jaw. Most of the time this is spent open. Okay, so this gets more dose as this jaw moves in this direction. Okay, so a Y1 wedge dynamic wedge is in, a Y2 dynamic wedge is out. Okay. And this is important because when you when you look at it on the console, it's not really important for us, but the therapists see this on the console. If they see Y1, that is a that's an in wedge. Okay. So if you come to the console and you're programming a wedge, just remember Y1 is 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 in and Y2 is out. Uh, you can remember it by saying that this Y the one could be an I, I for in. Okay. Uh, what about right and left? We can't do right and left. We have to rotate the call here. Okay. All right, what was I going to say? <clears throat> Two directions. Okay, field size limitation. This Y1 jaw or this Y2 jaw have a limitation of how far they can move. Obviously, they're connected to a motor and a drive mechanism. So they, can, they can't just go all the way across to some really large field. They have a limitation. Their limitation is, you guys know what it is? Okay, I'll tell you. This limitation is 10 cm over travel and travel, 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 and 20 cm in other direction. All right, so what does this mean? So 10 cm over travel. Over travel always means that we're traveling across the central axis. Okay, so we have this wedge can go 10 cm in that direction from central axis, 10 cm. And this wedge can start at 20 cm from the central axis. Okay, so this the maximum field size. So if it can do 20 cm in this direction and 10 cm in the other direction, what's the maximum field size? 30 asymmetric. Okay, it's asymmetric because it can do 10 in here, 20 here. 
But if you have a 10 by 10 field, it can do a 10 by 10 case. Uh, it can do a, a symmetric 10 by 10 because it can over travel. Well, it can over travel 5. It can do 20 cm symmetric because 20 cm, 20 by 20 is 10 cm here and 10 cm there. So since we know that it can over travel 10 cm, it could do a 20 cm symmetric field. It just can't do anything above a 20 by 20 uh, symmetric field. It can't do a 25 by 25. Symmetric. Okay. So, uh, but it can do a thirty. It can do a thirty, but asymmetric, meaning that the the center of the field of a thirty is going to be shifted back um, ten cm, in this, five cm in this direction. That's where the center of the field is going to be. Yeah. I'll comment on this. Why would the area under the toe get the least dose? Wouldn't that be the highest dose? Yeah. Did I say least? Yeah, it says least. Where? Uh, the area under the moving jaw's toe gets the least dose. Right above the oh, that's wrong. Sorry. Okay. The area. Yeah. That's right. Okay. Yeah. Well, okay. I'll fix it. Anyway. Oops. What did I just do? I hit no. Keep those, keep those annotations. Oh, I lost. Oh, there they are. Okay, that's wrong. So it's the most. Thanks for catching that. Okay, so and now moving on to universal. Does that does that all make sense? Okay, moving on to universal. A sixty degree wedge resides in the head of the machine. This is a different kind of wedge, and spends a predetermined time in the field. The fraction of the time it spends in the beam determines the wedge angle. Okay, so picture this little wedge up in the head of the machine. It rides on a motor, moves in and out, up in the head of the machine, and gets in the field or out of the field. And it's a 60 degree, it's the equivalent of a 60 degree wedge. Okay. So if you want to use a 60 degree wedge in your treatment plant, and you have 100 monitor units to deliver for a field or with a 60 degree wedge, that wedge is going to be in the field for 100 monitor units. Okay. If you want to use a 30 degree wedge, that wedge at some point will pull out of the beam and deliver part of the beam is open. So part of it is with the wedge in, part of it's open. That's how it gets wedge angles that are not 60. Okay. The advantage, again, the therapist doesn't have to enter the room, can be programmed remotely. Uh, the disadvantage, it makes the head design a little more complicated because they have to make room for this for this wedge up there. Okay, And it's difficult to repair that wedge. Okay, and then here's the, the wedge equation. So um, this is how the wedge is being wedged. Okay, so, it, so in an elective machine, there's a... There's a weight given to the open portion, open field part, and there's a weight given to the uh, wedged beam part. And that's how you determine the wedge angle. And that, how do you determine that beam weight? Well, it's determined through this equation. Okay. So if you have a, say your wedge angle is 35, you can put any wedge angle you want, as I understand it. Put, a, put your wedge angle in here, and then it calculates 10 of the desired wedge angle divided by 10 of the motorized motorized wedge angle, so say the motorized wedge angle is 60. Okay, so it calculates what you want, 10 of what you want divided by 10 of what that wedge angle is, and that's your beam weight for the wedge field. Okay, so what's, what if you're, if you want a 60, 10 of 60 over 10 of 60 is 1. So the beam weight for that field is 1, which means that the, the wedge is going to be in for the whole time, for the whole number of monitor units. So, that equation makes it seem like the motorized wedge can be an angle different than 60. Yeah, okay. yeah. I guess it does. Yeah. Uh, I've always I've always known those wedges to be 60. Okay. Maybe that's just a generic equation. Anyway, so variant enhanced dynamic wedge. The angles possible with variant are those 10, 15, 20, 30, 45, 60. How many are possible with hard wedges? Which ones are the options? Uh, I think it's angle 15, 30, 45, 45. Yeah. Okay, so you've got two more with, with enhanced dynamic wedge. The length of the treatment time is divided into segments, and the speed of the moving jaw and the dose rate within each segment are controlled based on the calculated segment treatment table generated by the LINAC computer. So the position of the jaw for each wedge angle and the dose rate will be different depending on the wedge angle. And it has control points. So it says, after this many number of monitor units for a dynamic wedge of 10 degrees, jaw has to be at this position. 
and the dose rate has to be such. So that's a table that, that exists. And actually, there's only one table for a 60 degree wrench. This table is then modified for the other angles. So the SDT, segmented treatment table, is essentially a table of position of moving job versus cumulative mounting units, as I just said. The SDT for a particular wedge delivery is a product of wedge averaging between an open field SDT and a 60 degree golden SDT table. Okay, these wedges, are, uh, these wedges don't harden the beam. They don't harden the beam because there's no metal in the way except the whole jaw. Okay, if the whole jaw is in the way, it gets zero dose. So there's no hardening of the beam. Uh, wedge profiles cannot be measured with a single chamber. Why? All right, so remember I talked about profiles and how we can run a, a chamber across the field and measure a wedge profile with a static wedge? Why can't you do that with a dynamic wedge? Because it's dynamic. <laughs> there's two things that are dynamic, the chamber and the wedge. So there's two things moving. Okay, so you couldn't, you couldn't measure it. Uh, so and so what, what happens is if it's, as the chamber starts moving, you know, and say the wedge is here, you know, the jaw is here, and the chamber is moving this way, and the jaw is moving this way. This chamber is measuring open field, so that's not a that's not a wedge field. It's open, all right. And then when it, then when they cross, it's measuring zero. So what's the profile going to look like? It's going to look like as well. This is going to drop to zero actually. This will drop to zero, you know. And the beam actually looks like that, so it's not going to be right. Okay, so what do you do? So you need to measure dynamic wedges with uh, either a linear array of detectors or with film. Okay. A linear array of detectors is uh, pretty available in most departments. Where would you find it? The profiler. Yeah, even more available <coughs> with the profiler. What's more available is another device. Mapcheck. Okay, you can use Mapcheck to measure it too. It's a little smaller than the profiler and not as good resolution, but you're right, profiler would be better than the map check. But if you don't have a profiler, you can use a, a map check just for QA purposes. Or you can use film as well. Why is this better? Because they sit there at one spot and they just integrate the dose as the wedge is moving. And so all the detectors are sitting there and they're measuring dose as it's going, as, as the wedge moves. Okay, and this is what an SDT table looks like in graphical form. And I'll explain what these things are. Um, the STT, the STT values are the brown line here with the X's through it. And this is for a 60 degree wedge. And then the, let's see, what we did is we, we looked at a profile, our dynamic wedge profile in X here. You know, we put interest points across the field and we looked at the, at the dose across the field, kind of like a profile for our dynamic wedge. And this is what we got, these purple dots. Okay, so that's the, the dose profile that XEO gave us. And by the way, just to explain, this is this is the x-axis and this is off-axis. So here's the asymmetric. This is the maximum field size from minus 20. So the jaw moves from minus 20 across, goes through zero, and this is the over travel all the way to 10. Okay, so it's a 30, 30 a centimeter field size. And here's the percent dose over here. Okay. So XCO gave us values that are this, this purple line. And then we measured with whatever film or I can't remember what we measured it with at that, at that time. And we measured the, the blue triangles. Are they triangles? Yeah, the blue triangles. And then we noticed that up here, is this the toe or the heel? It's the toe. So up, at, up by the toe, we found a small difference. Okay, percent dose. And the difference was really small, too, about, you know, it looks like left, about a half a percent. Let's try and percent, 200. Why these 050, 100, 150? 250 percent dose. Uh, what do those numbers correspond to? Is that the absolute dose? That could be the absolute dose, yeah. Yeah, it could be the absolute dose, and the other one's a percent. Percent dose. Um, but anyway, the point is that there's a, it was a, we found about a half percent difference, and it's a small difference, but we wanted to correct it. Okay, so we corrected it by adjusting the SDT table. Okay, and so once we adjusted them, we can go into the SDT table and type numbers in. Once we adjusted it, then it came down. That's that's what these the 
the XO after the adjustment of the XO values. Okay. So why is there a sudden drop off at nine centimeters? Uh, I'm not sure what that point is. Yeah, I don't know what that last point is. If that's the toe, that's the part. That could be that could be the just being under the jaw. That could be the part under the jaw. It's getting into the penumbra. That could be the penumbra region. Yeah. So anyway, the point of this graph is that you could go in and you could measure your you could measure your profiles, and then if they don't agree with what your planning system is giving you, you can adjust the SDG table to agree. They usually agree though. I mean, this is an old this is an old graph, and it's an old version of Axio. Um, since then, I've made measurements, and they're spot on with the EDW. Okay, wedge factors. We talked about static wedge factors and how to measure them. You do the same process for EDW, same measurement process. So it's dose, um, dose or reading with the wedge divided by dose or reading without the wedge. Okay. So they're very different for dynamic wedge. Uh, for static wedges, it's very intuitive. As the wedge angle gets higher, your wedge factor gets lower because the thickness of the metal is bigger. As energy goes up, uh, wedge factor goes up. As field size goes up, wedge factor goes up. It's not that intuitive with this. So with this, the biggest the biggest factor that affects the the wedge factor is the field size. So if we pick a if we pick a ten by ten, for example, okay, this one it goes from. 982, 948 to 876. And we pick a 30, 94, 851, and 682. See, there's a huge jump here between the 20 by 20 and the 10 by 10. Uh, and what about a wedge angle? Between 10 by 10 and 60 by 6, and six, between a 10 degree EDW and a 60 degree EDW, the wedge factor doesn't change all that much. Okay. What about, and this is a 10 by 5. Okay, 10 by 10. Uh, yeah, big change here. There is a big change here, but not as much here. Uh, same thing here. Big change there. Okay, so they're not that intuitive. You know, kind of have to. You just have to remember that um, if you go from a if you go from a ten to a sixty for a ten by ten, you're gonna have a big jump, but not that big a jump for a ten by five. Okay, so um, so it's just you should have a. Uh, all the departments have tables of, of dynamic wedge factors, so so definitely when you're checking your you just check your check against the table. Okay, calculating now we're going back to the hard wedges. Okay, so we're changing subjects back to hard wedges, and these slides should probably be with the hard wedges. So I'm, let's we're going to calculate the attenuation coefficient of static wedges. So, and this is useful for, say you're doing a monitor, hand monitor unit calculation and the point is off axis uh, or even off, on axis. This is, this is uh, how you calculate the dose rate at a point off axis anywhere, anywhere through the thickness of the wedge. So, this is the classic exponential attenuation equation. The dose is equal to um, the initial dose times the exponent of the negative of the attenuation coefficient times the thickness. And this is effective, by the way. Why is it effective? It's effective because we may not know what the wedge is made of, so we don't know the material. And it's effective also because it's we're using uh, polyenergetic beams, such as 6 MV or 10 MV or 18 MV. And the mu, usually if you want to look up a mu, you need to know what the energy is. Okay? So this is the effective mu average through the polyenergetic spectrum and for some material that we don't really know. So. What is the wedge factor? So the wedge factor again is the dose with the wedge divided by the dose without the wedge. Okay. And if we rearrange this, we can take the mu effective out of this equation, and then we're going to take this d over d zero and bring this down here and solve for mu. So now mu becomes one over minus one over t times the log, natural log of the wedge factor. Okay. So we can use that. We can use this to calculate the dose to a point inside the patient through any part of the wedge, if we know the thickness of that part of the wedge. Okay, so the dose is equal to the, um, the initial dose times E minus mu T. So once you know mu, you need, uh, you need to calculate the thickness of the wedge through the photon, the ray line to get through the photon, the ray line of the wedge through the photon, the ray line. I don't think this should be. The thickness of the wedge through the photon ray line to get the attenuation. Okay, so from here, 
glitch. I think there's something else in there. Hmm. Well, anyway, this is to calculate the dose at this point. You can say you know the wedge vector. I'll give you a problem and I said, here's the beam, here's the wedge you're going to use, and here's the wedge vector. Okay. Tell me what the dose rate is at this point based on, the, based on this beam. You can easily tell me what the dose rate, rate is at the central axis because it's the number of mono units. Well, remember this equation? Say the dose is 100, and then this is the dose rate down here. Okay. So if I say, if I tell you how many mono units, you, you can, um, and the dose rate is composed of TMR times um, S sub CP times wedge factor. And so if I tell you, if I tell you what the wedge factor is at central axis, you, uh, you can just multiply these and then tell me what the dose rate is, okay, at that point. But say I, I ask you what, I ask you to calculate the dose rate at a point off axis. This is all at central axis. What about off axis? Well, off axis, you need to, there's a new wedge factor. Because wouldn't the dose be higher if you're going through a thinner part of the wedge than a thicker part of the wedge? Okay. So to calculate that new wedge factor, um, you'd need to know, I'd have to, I'd probably have to give you mu, the, the attenuation material, and I have to give you thickness. So once I give you thickness and mu, then you have a new wedge factor. Okay to calculate that. Or I could give you um, I could give you the wedge factor through the central axis. There's a wedge factor through the central axis that's going to be different than the wedge factor off axis. I could give you the wedge factor at the central axis and then from that and the thickness and I could give you the thickness of this part and then you guys can calculate the effect of mu okay, for that for that part of the wedge. And then you can calculate the dose using this. Okay. So that's how you'd calculate doses and dose rates off axis to a wedge. Okay, beam combinations. So post fields, uh, so we're gonna just quickly talk about what isodoses look like for beam combinations. I keep looking at that time. We're gonna, we're gonna try to wrap this up. So beam combinations can be APPA, right, left laterals, RPO, LA obliques, etc. Then just when two beams come together and they, the doses add up. Uh, opposed beam isodoses typically look like an hourglass to the, due to the beam shoulder fall off at greater depths, tends to produce hot beam axis of cool centers. Increasing beam energies helps with penetration, but usually is used for larger separations due to high exit dose. And then do I have there? Yeah. So uh, I might ask you guys on an exam or on a question to show some isodoses, to draw some isodoses for beam combinations. Okay, so for opposed beams, you just need to remember that at the center of a large separation, these will start to bow in. And the reason they start to bow in is because the profile, okay, here's the profile at 10 cm depth. The profile as you get deeper, you lose, you lose dose coverage on the sides. And you lose dose coverage on the sides because the energy, remember how the energy of the beam changes, whether compared at the center of the beam compared to the size of the beam? Because the center, the center of the beam, um, here's a, here's a, and it's because of the flattening filter. The photons going through the center of the beam are much higher energy because they go through a lot of core metal and they're hardened. So as you get deeper, you start to lose um, you start to lose intensity at the sides because those are the lower energy components and they get attenuated more. Okay? So as you lose that component, then the, the edges of the beam, the, the intensity starts to drop and that's why this bows in. Okay? So um, that's why that comes in. So just keep that in mind. If you're trying to treat a, a tumor that's in the center of, the, of, a, of a patient, if the patient has a very large separation, it's going to be hard to treat that tumor. Um, with a small field size, you might have to increase that field size so that these isodose lines open up and you can get full coverage. As this separation shrinks, that hourglass starts to disappear. And those lines start to get straight again because now you're using a beam that looks like this. You're using a flat beam okay, that, has, that has a full 
a full uh, scatter, even even all the way up to the edges of the beam. All right, and then this the difference between this and this. I think they just had they just renormalized it. Each beam given at 100 at D max. So so this beam here uh, is weighted 100 centigrade to D max. This one's weighted 100 centigrade to D max. This extra 29 is due to the exit the exit contribution. And then B, each beam is given 100 at the isocenter. So in this case, the weight point is assigned at the isocenter, and beam A gives 100 to the isocenter, and beam B gives 100. And it just shows that um, this, this beam here is going to give more dose than this beam here. Okay, and then this is, I've drawn this plot before. This is a plot just to, to show you what happens to the dose when there's two, when there's opposing beams. And the difference in energies, and it's something that you should keep in mind uh, for the cobalt 60. This is a PD for cobalt 60. D max is 0.5, and then it drops really quickly. Okay, so if you're trying to treat the center, a uh, tumor in the center of a patient with a cobalt 60 beam, look at how much dose D max is going to get compared to the center. I mean, you're you're going to create. You have to keep this in mind when you're. You say you want to give 200 a day to the center. What's D max going to get? For cobalt 60. So 25 percent more, right? So a quarter more, that's 50 more. So um, yeah, it's going to get uh, 200, 250 at D max. Now they may, that may or may not be an issue. If you're treating pelvis, maybe it's not that big a deal. But say you're treating head and neck, um, where there's, I don't know, you're trying to spare parotids, that could be an issue. Okay. And, and actually, head and neck is not a good example because the separation is so small. So that effect might not be, we're going to shrink, for a small separation, we shrink this down, that effect might not be as pronounced. This is a separation of 25. So 25 is, so that could be like an APPA, it could be an APPA separation. Okay. So this could be cord, and you could be irradiating cord there. So that's something to keep in mind. Okay. And so the, the effect is proportional to energy. At 25, 25 MV for a separation of 25, it's almost a flat beam, which means that the whole volume gets the same amount of dose. So I might ask you guys to draw isodoses for APPA beams on a patient for 25 MV, and they would look like this. Okay, this would be 100, and then the 90 would look very similar. Okay, and the 80, because look, look, the 90, the 100, they're all, well, the 90, the 90 would be a little bit smaller, so the 90 would be um, a little bit outside outside the 100. But if it's cobalt 60, the isodose lines would not look like this at all. The isodose lines would look, uh, I'd have like a, I'd have, probably have like 120 here, okay, and 120 here. Okay, and then the, um, then as I get deeper, I'd go, I'd start to get this hourglass in here, and that might be the 110, okay, and then the 100, 100 would be, let's see, the 100 would be down here. So the 100 would be uh, bigger. It would be like that. Okay, so they look completely different. So beam weighting, contribution from a particular beam could be expressed. Well, I guess you could leave a period there. Beam weighting has to do with, with how much each beam is contributing to the dose. And it could be expressed as a percentage. So increasing weighting from a particular beam, including combined beams, enhances dose to the area closest to that beam. So if you increase, if you have got an APPA beam and you increase the AP, you're going to get more dose in the AP area. Okay, you increase the beam, beam weight. It's used to treat tumors that are not centered or, not, or to treat central tumors where the isocenters are not in the tumor. Used to enhance dose from a particular side. Okay, so here's an example of two lateral beams, A and B. The tumor is the red spot. Which one's got to have more weight? He's going to have more weight. Okay. The isocenter is in the center of the patient in this case. So if we didn't weight beam B, our isodose distribution would look like that. It would be even. Okay. And then, but if we weighted beam B, let me change the color. If we weighted beam B, our isodose distribution might look like that. Okay. A little bit higher out there. Okay. And we don't need to treat this, so it makes sense to weight beam B. So here's an example. A doctor needs to deliver 180 a day using APPA technique. The lung tumor is 4 cm deep anteriorly and 20, 23 posteriorly. The isocenter is midplane. 
Would you write the AP or PA more heavily? AP. Okay. AP. Because it's for standard theory, it's all shallow, correct? Okay, say you weigh the AP with 70% and the PA with 30, how do you calculate MUs? Okay, so how does, obviously the MUs have to change. Okay, they have to be higher for the AP than the PA, and we have to know how to calculate that. So, that comes in, I think I have the equation. Okay. How do you have the solution? I don't have it. I discussed it. I discussed it? Discussed. Well, anyway, it's the same as the previous MU equation, except that the field dose... FD will not be 90 centigrade from each side. It won't be 90, 90. It will be 180 times 0.7 for the AP and 180 times 0.3 for the PA. Okay. And so in an MU equation, so if we do MU equals, so now the field dose up here is we're not we can't just take 90. We have to take 180. Why we why did we take 90 before? Because the field weight was 0.5. So now we're going to take 180 times the field weight. In this case, it's 70% for the AP. So this is MUAP. And when you guys are writing this in an assignment or or, uh, um, or in tests, if you label things like this, it helps us correct too. And it helps me know what, what you're doing. So MUAP um, times 1 CGY per MU, that inherent value, times the TMR, times S sub CP. Okay? So then this value up here, 180 times 0.7, Will be um, will be the field dose for that field. Okay. okay, and then combinations of wedges. Um, this is a this is just an example of how you treat a tumor. This is a head a slice out of the out of the neck and a head and neck patient. And so this tumor is it's close to the surface. And what we want to do is we could treat bilateral. We can come in this way and this way. I mean, not bilateral, but opposed. Usually the word bilateral means that the tumor is on both sides. So, uh, but if we want to treat opposed beams, we could do that, but we'd be irradiating this whole area that's healthy. Okay. So to prevent doing that, we use this technique called a scooping technique, where a beam comes in this way, and a beam comes in this way, and if you didn't have wedges, it would be extremely hot in this area here, because for two reasons. One, the beams overlap, and two, the depth is really shallow. Okay. So that would be really hot. To prevent that, we put we put in wedges heel to heel, okay. And so that so the profile of this looks looks like this. Ooh, that's not a good drawing. So it's low down, it's low here. So the dose is low here, and the dose is low there. So those two low doses reduce this hot spot, and you get you get decent coverage of the tumor. Okay. So then there's a, just a rule of thumb. If you use that technique for heel to heel technique, the wedge angle is equal to 90 degrees minus the um, the angle that, that separates the two fields. That's just a that's just a rule of thumb. Okay, and not using wedges would create a hot spot. Beam combinations also three fields. So if you have three fields like this, um, if you if you just had two fields, you might get a pretty even distribution if you had a high energy beam. But adding this three field now makes this area interior a hot spot. Why is this hot and not even? It's hot because this part, this area down here, is going to get less dose from this beam due to attenuation. Okay, so um, of course, um, this doesn't get hot here because the, the, there's no lateral beam contribution to that area. Okay, and it doesn't get hot here again because there's no lateral beam. So the area where they're all adding up is this portion right here, and this part is going to get hotter than that, and it's going to get quite a bit hotter. So how do we how do we avoid that? We put wedges on the lateral fields, okay? And so that reduces the dose here and reduces the dose here. So that that the dose reduction doesn't add up as much to this end, to this um, field that's coming from this direction. Okay, and then uh, tumor dose specification. I'm sure you guys covered this in Iraq, huh? No? Okay, we can cover it now. Uh, tumor dose specification to for external photon beams. These are just definitions that you need to know. This comes from ICRU, International Commission on Radiation Units. Okay, so it's a very important commission. They put out uh, documents that uh, that we all use. First, GTV. You'll hear this over and over. Gross tumor volume. GTV is the primary tumor. It's palpable, or it can be metastatic. Okay? It doesn't always have to be palpable, but a GTV is typically the tumor that the when I say palpable, the, the patient can feel it. 
or it's also visible on imaging. Okay, so that's another way that you can image it. Traditionally, this was not valid, but today, since we use so much imaging, it's uh, it's okay to find a GTV based on imaging. Okay, CTV, clinical target volume. It's the tumor, which is the GTV, plus any presumed tumor. Okay, so the CTV is a margin or outside the GTV. It doesn't have to be an even margin. It could be a margin that goes in, in directions that the doctor decides. So lung, lung, uh, a lung tumor, for example, you might be able to see the tumor on CT. The doctor could contour the GTV, but physicians know that lung tumors are bigger than that, the physical the tumor. Even though you can't see it on CT, there's tumorcidal cells around it. And so that's what we call the CTV. It's that area around the tumor where there's suspicion of cancer cells, actual presence of cancer cells that are suspected to be there that we want to treat. Okay, so that increases the that increases the volume that we want to treat. And then PTV. Finally, PTV is the planning target volume, and the PTV is a CTV plus a margin for setup. It's margin for setup, location, and penumbra considerations. Usually, the physics department establishes margins for PTV. And the PTV margins are established based on how well the physics department thinks that the patient's being set up every day. So if the patient moves from day to day, uh, typically, let's just say they come up with a number. In our department, our patients are set within are set up within one centimeter. Okay, that's our margin of error. That's that's we, so we need to add one cm to this because if we don't add that one cm, we're going to be missing some of the, some of the CTV. So we need to add that 1cm to the CTV for setup uncertainty. Uh, and that's this one, okay, for setup and location. And then for number of considerations, that's, that's something else. You want to expand, if, if your CTV is this big, yeah, that's your CTV, and you place your jaws here and here. So you're going to treat this one. Are you going to treat this as much as you're going to treat this area? No, because this area here gets scattered from all the photons that are scattering up here and there, this area just gets scatter, but well, it's not scatter, it just gets primary. And it gets no scatter from, from here because there's a jaw here. Okay, so you need to open up your jaws to allow for scatter to cover this area. Okay, so that's what we call block margin or MLC margin. You have to open up your MLCs to ensure that there's enough scatter lateral to the tumor that's going to cover this, this part of the tumor. Okay, so PTV is primarily patient setup and, um, and block margin. And then there's ITV. And ITV comes into play when we start thinking about movement, intrafraction movement, what's happening during, during the treatment. The patient, when the patient's breathing, that lung tumor is moving around. Okay, so the ITV is the internal target margin. And so if we think that the tumor moves a CM sub -inf, so this is a CTV again, and if we think that this tumor moves a CM sub -inf, then we're going to apply a CM margin in this direction, and then a CM margin in this direction, and we're going to call that the ITV. ITV. This is a T. Okay, that's the ITV. And actually, what I should be what I should be doing is drawing the PTV, not the CTV. So here's the here's the CTV, PTV, CTV, PTV, and then if this tumor is going to move, then this PTV is going to move too. Now we've got another one. We have ITV. Okay, that's ITV for movement. So they get bigger. You get the ITV is going to be the biggest, the biggest volume. And then here's all the, all the margins that we were, all the um, structures that we were talking about. GTV is the smallest one, and then clinical target volume, and then planning target volume is this red one. Oh, they don't have ITV in there. Okay. And then treated treated volume is a volume that um, you can a doctor can pick an isolated line and say, I want to know how much is getting more than fifty percent of the dose. And so we can you can define that as your treated volume. Okay. So it's some volume that that gets more than a certain amount of dose. And then the irradiated volume is the, is the whole volume that gets those. Okay, that's all I count. Okay, that's it.
Any questions, comments, discussions, complaints? I know that we've talked about a lot of things. This is a lot more clinical than the other, than the first part, huh? The first one. Yeah. Okay. Stop the recording.